Hobby Quick Hits. Delivering that breaking hobby news. Directly to your earlobes. You want to know those hot drops from the car shop? We've got you covered. With your host, John Newman. Hello everyone, it's another episode of Hobby Quick Hits, episode 150 to be exact, holy smokes, even when I think about, you know, the the combined shows, right, Sports Car Nation, we're in the high 220s, and this one, 150, that's, you know, almost uh, 400 episodes uh, combined, where does the time go? Well, speaking of time, I just returned from a weekend trip, Friday, Saturday, left this morning, Sunday, just got back and uh, recording this episode. I went to uh, Springfield, Massachusetts uh, for a card show and hobby panel at the Basketball Hall of Fame, the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame, first time there. Uh, invited by Rob Gerard, sports car therapist, uh, and uh, had a great time. So we're, this show is going to talk about uh, that trip in, in chronicle uh, logical order. Not going to be, not going to make it any longer than it has to be. Just cover uh, the main uh, crux of kind of how the trip went, what I did, and uh, all that it, it entailed. But before we get to that, let's hear from our great sponsors, Mojo Break, and after that. We'll get to some hobby news, the release schedule, and then the trip review. MojoBrakeShop.com is the best place to get your sealed wax products and brakes. They not only have the best selection, but the best prices. Whether it's a box or a whole case, they are your guys. They ship worldwide to your doorstep. Their reputation as one of the most trusted in the hobby goes unmatched. They are the 2021 Topps Rip Party Champion Breakers. From sports card to Pokemon cards, their selection can't be beat. They offer daily deals and pre-orders. Hey guys, John Newman here. Mojo's prices are already great, but to save an additional 10% off anything in their store, use the code QUICKHITS. That's Q-U-I-C-K-H-I-T-S. Check out the full service store that's open seven days a week in Santa Clara, California, or the website at mojobreak.com. Let's check out this week's Hobby Wax Releases. Take it away, Owen. Hey guys, it's Owen from Sports Card Shop. Let's go over the week releases. On the 12th, we have 2022 23 Panini Prism Basketball. 2022 23 Panini Prism Premier League Soccer Breakaway. 2023 Premier Break of the Pieces of the Past Historical One of One Edition. 2023 Star Hidden Treasures Football Autographed Full Size Helmet. And on the 14th, we have 2022-23 Vivid Leaf Vivid Basketball. 2022-23 Panini Donner Soccer. 2022-23 Panini Playbook Football. Pokemon 2023 Mini Portfolio. 2022 Tops Dynasty Baseball. And the 19th, we have 2022, you know, 2023 Panini Prism WWE Undercard. 2022-23 Panini Revolutions Basketball. 2022-23 Panini Select La Liga Soccer. 2023 Super Break of the Pieces of the Past Art and Music. 2020, 2023 Super Glow One Time Edition Series 1. 2022 Tops Metazoo Chrome. 2022 Upper Deck AEW Alu Wrestling. 2022 Upper Deck AEW Skybox Metal Universe. 2021 22 Upper Deck Credentials Hockey. Uh, 2021 22 Upper Deck SP Authentic Hockey. And on the 21st, we have 2021 23. 22-23 Leaf Optic Chrome Basketball. 2022 Panini Clearly Don Rush Football. 2021-22 Panini Flawless Basketball. And last but not least, 2023 Wild Card Auto Mania Rookie and Prospects Edition Baseball. Have a great day. Congratulations to the Gocher family as they prepare to open up their second location, LCS. 
Uh, they're originals in New Buffalo, Michigan, going very strong. And they are working on opening up their Valparaiso, Indiana shop. And I uh, saw some pics. It's going to be very nice uh, as their first shop is, too. So congratulations uh, to the Gocher family. Let's go around the hobbyverse and catch up on this week's hobby news. Yep, it's the same old story, same old song and dance, my friends, as Steven Tyler so elegantly said. What am I talking about? Beckett, once again, uh, happened at the Mint. Now, you got to remember, we do have a quick hits every other week now, so we have to cover two weeks of hobby news in each episode. So I know this is not new news, it happened at the Mint, but I uh, wanted to give my take and, and report it on this show. And uh, at the Mint, Beckett, who was there, announced a new uh, gem mint grading scale. Um, uh, the first mistake that happened was they their scale was wrong that they had up on the Mint wall to what they announced. So they had to put duct tape or some kind of tape over one part of it. So that looked not so hot and then the grading scale announcement was met with a lot of resistance and uproar and people in the hobby not happening uh happy about it and then the next day uh and then they made this announcement on april 1st and then the next day they said never mind uh after people complaining we're we'll forget forget what we said And again, it was another instance of Beckett shooting itself uh, in the foot and another bad look. And this company just continues to be unable to get out of its own way and kind of self-inflicted wounds here. And uh, don't know what direction they're going in. I'm not sure they do uh, either. But once again, you know, each, each of these mistakes just kind of compounds and that window of opportunity closes for them to be really viable in the grading space against as they once were. And I think they're tackling issues. You know, Danny Black said this on, uh, on, on hobby hotline. I believe I'd be, I believe they're tackling issues that aren't the biggest one. They've got to get their priorities in order. They need to get cards sent to them. They, you rarely see Beckett reveal videos on YouTube now with, with graded unboxings and their name is just not talked about in the grading space like it used to be. And they need, that's number one. They've got to try to get back on that ledge uh, that they've fallen off. How do you do that? If you ask me, you got, I know they don't like to do this when it comes to margins and ROI, but they got to lower their sub prices. They've got to get people sending in cards just because they're at 10 to 12 bucks and get their name on YouTube like it used to be uh, rather than worry too much about a scale they've had for a while and, and not too many complaints about it uh, before. So they got to get the priority straight. You know, I don't know who's calling the shots, if it's multiple people. And they, again, you know, Keystone capers, but not a good look. So uh, then that's, and then that's not the biggest story of the week. The, the biggest story uh, of the week is Fanatic slash Panini. You might remember some months back that Panini was rumored to be soon to be acquired by Fanatics. Uh, you know, if you listen to certain people, it was all but done, all but announced. And then it kind of went dormant, went quiet, right? We didn't hear any more about that. I'm like, what happened, right? But it kind of just the story just sort of went away. So what I believe happened was, I I believe where there was smoke, there was fire, but I think the Fanatics offer to Panini was too low. They said, thanks, but no thanks. We're we're not selling uh, to you for that price. You're not acquiring us for that price. And if you know anything about Michael Rubin and uh, his Fanatics team, they are, you know, cutthroat and very strategic, right? Nothing illegal here, but, you know, they ain't messing around. So at the Mint Collective, it's been reported they made several offers to several top and important key cog executives at the Mint Collectives of Panini. 
uh, a majority of those offers were accepted. And when the show was over and the Panini staff got back to the building on Monday, they turned in their resignations and announced they were taking their talents to the fanatic side. And we're talking some major players on Panini. So this was like a major direct hit. You know, I use an analogy, right? It's like a, a battleship, right? And a torpedo hits right right in the engine room, right? Where all the gears and, and you know, everything gets that uh, ship going. Uh, right to, right to the, the center of the ship. And so... What do you think the the goal is, right? I mean, it's obvious, right? Fanatics wants to weaken Panini to a point where they have no choice but to sell uh, to Fanatics, much like what they did with Tops, where they they undermined Tops just before the SPAC was to go public and sunk that ship and all the stock potential stock value with it and then acquire tops right very strategic some might call it you know a little low blow or dirty pull but it's not illegal uh all above board as far as uh financial laws go and so i i, I think it'll be very soon we hear uh panini uh you know sell to fanatics however it's been reported on linkedin that uh, you know, uh, one of the higher ups that stayed at Panini uh, has listed those positions as available and is looking to fill them uh, rather quickly. So Panini's trying to the the hustle and survive and and keep their head above water. Let me go over some of the names that are going to Fanatics from Panini. VP of Product Develop uh, Product Development Nick. Matt Jevick, Director of Football Product Development, Rob Springs, Brand Managers Tim Yoda and Adam Johnson, uh, Tim Trout, Keith Hauer uh, as well will be joining uh, Fanatics. And uh, there's probably more that uh, we don't know the names uh, officially yet. But uh, half of the acquisitions department of Panini are joining uh, fanatic. So a big blow, uh, with let's, let's be frank folks, right? The, uh, the goal of this is to get the licensing f- for basketball and football sooner than 2026. That's the strategic goal here. Uh, stay tuned to see how the fanatics turns or how this, how this winds up. Also at the mint, Fanatic slash Tops announced their Major League debut patches. Every debut, rookie debut in the Major Leagues this year, that player will have a MLB debut patch on his shoulder sleeve. Just the right size for a one-of-one card to be produced with that patch. No word on what product these patch cards will be put in. No word of... You know how they will be distributed. Will be pack. Will be redemption. Although we know Fanatics does not like redemptions, uh, we're not sure if they'll be RPAs or just uh, just the patch. But they will be one of one. They have announced that. They're not going to cut the patch up into multiple pieces. It will be the whole patch. It will be a one of one card, and it's going to be interesting to see how these are distributed, and, you know, what these things go for once they're live on the secondary market, right? You got, uh, you know, Anthony Volpe, Yankees rookie starting shortstop, uh, you know, often compared to Derek Jeter, although it's very early for those comparisons. But what does that card of him bring once it's, you know, pulled or or acquired? So it's going to be interesting to say the least. Babe Ruth's bat photo matched to being used at the Polo Grounds has set the new record for most money uh, at auction from a game used bat. Uh, Babe Ruth uh, brought, this bat brought almost $2 million, 1850 k The seller, Justin Cornett, Bought that bat in February of 2018 for $400,000. So it's always nice when you can always almost five times your money, uh, especially when it's five times 
uh, almost five times 400 uh, K and what what made the difference that went in the hunts auctions what made the dis difference in the jump in value is the authentication of that bat to when it was used in, in photo mat so uh, congratulations to Justin Cornett Robert Edward auctions is rolling out their spring uh, auction uh, highlighted by a PSA 9 Roberto Clemente 1955 uh, top some other notables say uh, Jackie Robinson uh, I know a guy that likes him uh, 1949 Bowman PSA 9 that's a beautiful card PSA 9 1955 top Sandy Koufax rookie I have half of a 9 I have a 4.5 SGC Koufax rookie but they're going to have a 9 uh, Bill Russell 1957 tops rookie PSA 7.5 and a Jim Brown Tops rookie SGC eight and a half uh, will be some of the highlights. Uh, Babe Ruth baseball single signed, rated eight and a half by PSA, with a mint nine signature and a 1921 Chrissy Matterson baseball dating to 1921, also at the Polo Grounds, and a 1940s Josh Gibson Type One photo, and 1913. Type 1 Joe Jackson photo by Charles Conlon. So uh, many, many great items are rolling out in the REA spring auction. Head over to REA to check that out and uh, bid if you're registered already, or if not, register to bid. Also, if you're of the reading persuasion, check out my monthly column at Sports Collectors Digest. SportsCollectorsDigest.com. I did a feature on Nick Brower, who recently opened up a new card store in New Hartford, New York, and is doing very well. Check the Hobby is the People column out on SportsCollectorsDigest.com. <laughs> now, our feature presentation. Let's talk about this Springfield, Massachusetts weekend trip. First off, thanks to Rob Gerard, sports car therapist, uh, reached out to me about a month ago, maybe six weeks ago. You know, said, "Hey, uh, love to have you come to the show, uh, set up there, and be part of the hobby panel that I'll be moderating on the Hall of Fame Basketball Hall of Fame uh, main stage." Uh, check my, you know, anytime you get an offer like that. Uh, that's a, a, a wonderful opportunity. Checked my schedule and made it happen. Happened to have the week off from school, spring break. So I left on Friday morning and uh, no event scheduled for Friday officially. So I, I came a day early to check out the Hall of Fame, uh, the Naismith Basketball Hall of Fame uh, in Springfield, Mass. Uh, left my house around 645, got there about uh, w uh, slightly after the Hall of Fame opened, around 10.15, it opens uh, at 10. And, uh, you know, spent a few hours uh, checking uh, the Hall of Fame out. It's the third Hall of Fame I've been to. I've been to Cooperstown for baseball and Canton for football, but this was my first time in the Basketball Hall of Fame. Uh, really nice place. It's kind of a, a dome building in the middle of sort of a, a plaza mall, like a strip mall, but uh, smaller scale. And it's not a huge place, uh, but, you know, they have a basketball court in the center. Uh, I heard one guy complaining, you know, the one thing I was a little bit disappointed with the basketball halls, they don't have plaques or busts as the Baseball and Football Hall of Fame. They have kind of a glass panels with each year's inductions class etched in, in the paneling. Uh, probably because of room. I'm told this is a newer version of the Basketball Hall of Fame, that it was in a different building, and they did things a little differently in the original building than they do uh, here. The only other thing, I mean, that's, you know, it is what it is. Still a beautiful place, still a Hall of Fame to pay your respects to the greats of the game. Lots of, of displays. The only other complaint that I can complain about or, or notice was not every piece of memorabilia in the glass displays had a description on it. 
on it. Some of it you could tell without a description, right? Uh, but a lot of a, a lot of things didn't, and you kind of had to let your, you know, mind think to what that might be, or, or try to put two and two together. So uh, I don't know if it's maybe a work in progress there, but I really had a good time. I, I spent a couple hours there. That's kind of all it took uh, to to uh, go through, grab some lunch, and headed to Enfield, Connecticut, which is seven miles away. That's where my hotel and where I was staying at. So I stayed in Enfield and made the trek, the long trek of seven miles to Springfield. Uh, but after the Hall of Fame, grabbed a, grabbed a quick bite to eat and then headed to my hotel room to uh, check in, get, uh, get my stuff uh, all situated, kind of relaxed, uh, you know, watched a little TV, unwound, and then uh, had made plans to go to dinner with Ken Carnes. Ken Carnes is the host of the Sports Card Lessons podcast, and I've gotten to know Ken a little bit more and, and, and talking to him and conversating with him, and uh, he was excited to hear I was making the trip. He also was serving on the discussion panel on Saturday night, and he said, hey, man, uh, you know, I got some things to do earlier in the day, but uh, how about Friday night? We grabbed some dinner, you know, in Enfield, and uh, we went to uh, Longhorn Steakhouse right near my hotel, and a uh, couple hours spent with Ken over some steaks and and uh, ribeye, and uh, it was a, a great, great conversation, uh, great camaraderie, you know, uh, talked uh, talked hobby, talked content creation, and uh, uh, talked life as well. And uh, really, uh, we probably could have talked a, a lot longer, but, uh, you know, a couple hours, and then, uh, you know, he was tired, I was tired, and it was time to get ready for the show the next day, right? And uh, especially me, I'm a guy who likes to get there early and get set up, and this was uncharted territory for me, right? This was my first show out of state, and I think double-digit years, uh, I used to do them all the time and then kind of stayed uh, local uh, in the last uh, last decade. So I uh, want to thank uh, Primetime uh, Sports, uh, John, uh, for the hospitality and uh, allowing me to set up at the Springfield show on, on Saturday. And, uh, you know, I, I set up, I was kind of in a block with the, Three or four other folks got to know them throughout the day and and talking to them and I, and I will say this the the locals were very friendly very helpful. Uh, one gentleman said, "Hey, well, before you leave, go to the Country Diner uh, in Enfield. It's one of the best diners you can ever go to. Get some breakfast there before you head back to Syracuse." And I I did listen to him. So Sunday morning. Uh, I did go to that diner and uh, for breakfast, and it was very, very good. So he was right on point with that. Uh, the show was okay, uh, you know, finance like for how I did it was. It was okay. Uh, I thought I would do a little bit better. Um, a lot of hockey, uh, and I didn't bring a lot of hockey, so I sort of guessed wrong. Uh, so I'll blame myself more than than anyone else. There and and a lot of times with a a local show, sometimes the the clientele, right? The co consumers have their dealers, they're sort of loyal and fond of, and I, I kind of saw a little bit of that. And I'm the new guy, and uh, you know, I don't know if that was an X factor or not, but I'm sure it, it didn't. You know, it didn't help. But uh, people were great. I saw some people from Central New York who came up to my table and talked to me. Hey, you know. Uh, it's weird seeing you here, but knew I was there. So that those uh, those were great conversations. I had a few other gentlemen uh, who were fans of the show, but didn't realize I was going to be fans of the podcast, Sports Car Nation. Didn't realize I was going to be set up there, and shook my hand. Was uh, glad to meet me in person for the first time, and that's always obviously a good feeling. Uh, JSA was on site doing authentication, and I have a. Steph Curry, personalized jersey that says, To John, thanks boss, on one letter. And he signed it on the other letter. Uh, I won't say who gave that to me, but it's uh, from a hobby dignitary that I'm fortunately friends with who was nice enough to give that to me. And I brought that with me knowing that JSA was going to be there, and I got that uh, authenticated. I gave them the provenance and 
let them know how it was uh, obtained and why and, and all that. And, uh, uh, you know, in about three hours, they uh, came back to my table, said it was uh, done, and I'll get the, uh, I get the letter and card uh, in the mail. But they put the JSA sticker as they do on, on any authenticated uh, jersey. So it's going to stay in my personal collection. It's not a for sale item, but I still wanted to get, you know, that uh, authenticated uh, as genuine, which I already knew it was uh, from where, who it came from and, and where it's the provenance uh, uh, of it. So the show, uh, you know, was 10 to 5. It was, it was longer than my, my home shows here in Syracuse, which are 9 to 3. Um, I, I'll say this. About 1 o'clock, it really seemed to slow down as far as spending goes. And uh, I know there was a Mohegan sh uh, Sun show like a week or two before that, and so maybe people had spent uh, some of their money uh, there. But uh, still fun doing a show and seeing fresh faces, right, people? You know, and I love all my regular faces, too, don't get me wrong, but always different perspective, right? And the other thing I noticed uh, doing the show is, and I'm, I'm, it gave me the idea to convert. I have kind of big, heavy Allstate aluminum glass cases got some weight to them you know the older i get the heavier those showcases are uh to lug around i've seen a good percentage of the dealers at the springfield show using bulletin board lockable bulletin board cases like the cases you see on a school wall or a, a you know a business wall with the like salary uh requirements and notices public notices and I thought that was really interesting. And they look sharp. Uh, they're acrylic, so you cannot, you can, they scratch easily, and you cannot use like Windex, which I'm a Windex guy on my glass cases. Uh, but I did order a couple of these when I got back. Uh, and I'm going to convert my Allstate cases to these two instead of the Allstate. Travel a little bit lighter, a little thinner. They're, they are definitely thinner. But a graded a graded card will fit in it, uh, and uh, so uh, look forward to. I haven't got them yet, but I'm going to convert over to those. And I, I I don't know how it is. I don't know if it's a Springfield thing or if this is a trend with shows. If you're a dealer and you use these or you've seen them, uh, let me know that this is probably more than a Springfield thing. And I imagine it is. And uh, uh, I thought it was very cool to see those. Uh, in action and uh, very portable, very light, and I'm I'm trying to get more uh, portable, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I get to to Sunday. Uh, so set show was over, packed, loaded my car up, and uh, the panel was an hour. The panel discussion was an hour after the show ended, so you had a little time to kind of pack up, load your car. And the Hall of Fame, where the where the, the hobby panel talk was, is about a mile away from where the show was at the Mass Mutual Center. So only took five minutes, eight minutes to get to the Hall of Fame. One thing I will say that's great about the Hall, especially compared to other Hall of Fames, the other two that I've been to, it has its own parking lot. You know, a lot in the other two Hall of Fames, you gotta try to find a, a spot on the street, which can be difficult at times, or park in their shuttle lo shuttle lots, which are a couple miles away, and take like a trolley or minibus to uh, the hall. Uh, but the hall, ba Basketball Hall of Fame has their own parking lot. Like, uh, you know, they were closed. They were just open for uh, the panel talk and then trade night following that. And so I uh, got a nice close uh, parking spot and... Uh, uh, went in and uh, uh, so well let's let me tell you who was on the panel uh, Rob Gerard was the moderator uh, he asked questions himself and took uh, questions uh, from the audience some good uh, questions uh, there the panel consisted of myself uh, Chris Costa of Costa cards uh, they're opening up multiple retail locations in even some sports venues John uh, the basketball card guy, who's a very prominent uh, hobby uh, gentleman. Uh, Ken Carnes, as I said earlier, sports card lessons. 
uh, and uh, MC Cards, Mike Kantz, uh, big consigner, big eBay seller, and does a lot of shows. He has quite uh, the inventory. I'm sure I bought a few cards uh, in the in the last few years myself uh, from him, uh, maybe not even realizing it. Uh, uh, Jake Roy, Jake Roy, uh, '90s basketball cards, uh, did all the cinematography and uh, uh, ran the the video, and uh, also uh, worked in the audience, uh, taking the audience questions. And uh, like I told Jake, he had he had every right to be up on the panel too, but he he wanted to do that and uh, did a, a great job. So a uh, shout out to Jake as well. Shout out to Rob. Uh, you know, being a, a panel moderator, you know, is, is, you know, like doing Hobby Hotline, is not as easy as some people uh, make it look and uh, did a uh, tremendous job. Uh, and we had some great questions from the audience about uh, a lot of it, like, where's the hobby going? What's the future of the hobby going like? Uh, some tips about how can I be a better seller or how, how do you adapt with an ever-changing ho uh, hobby. Uh, Rob asked some, you know, content creator uh, questions as well. And it was a fun time. We all kind of took turns uh, answering and sharing, you know. Uh, two guys uh, shared one mic, and, when you know, we would just pass it uh, to the next guy. Very seamless, no no issues. And uh, it was a fun night. It was streamed on uh, Rob's uh, IG live. And uh, I think I, I'm sure he left it up. For posterity, you might hear it in a future audio episode as well. Uh, if you get a chance, uh, take a listen. A lot of, lot of great information uh, came out of the event. Uh, had a decent uh, amount of people in the crowd, and it was, it was, it was fun to do. It was the hour went quick uh, to me anyway. It seemed like we had started, and it was, it was time to wrap up and. Uh, that really was the end of my trip. I did go back uh, to my hotel to get a night's sleep before heading back to Syracuse uh, Sunday morning. And I am back now and recording this uh, here pretty soon after my return to get this episode out on Monday, as I always do. And again, I want to thank all the powers that be. I want to thank uh, Rob Gerard for the invite. Uh, John from the New England Card Show for his hospitality. Uh, you know, Jake uh, for doing uh, that at the hobby panel. All my fellow hobby panelists and, uh, you know, Ken for his friendship and, uh, you know, getting to go to dinner with him Friday and, uh, you know, breaking the ice and finally meeting him in person. It was a great trip. Uh, quick three days, uh, two and a half days or whatever it worked out to be. And, uh, you know, three hours and 15 minute drive. So driving back, uh, went some went to breakfast at the Country Diner in Enfield. Uh, definitely highly recommended if you're ever in the air, that area. Uh, and then I got on the road about 7.15. Uh, and uh, well, about 8 o'clock, got on the road and... Uh, Made the trek home, uh, three, like I said, about a little, little over three hours. And, you know, when you drive and you're by yourself, right, you, you think about observations. And I really thought about, you know, I got a show coming up here in Syracuse on uh, the April 19th. And, you know, I saw some things, how people, you know, you always take inspiration or ideas from how other people set up. So, like I said, I got two of these bulletin board type cases coming to replace my over 20 year old all state cases which are still battle tested they've they've got definitely some some war wounds but it's time to go a little bit lighter and a little more modern uh, i'd say with these bulletin board cases which are not really designed for cards but you never know it when you see cards in them it's it's it's, it's kind of funny and so I got a couple of those coming, but I'm also going to redo some of my, the way I do my, you know, monster boxes and chew boxes with vintage and, and by player and by numbered cards and by variations and game use. Uh, I, I'm going to try to streamline it. There's some cards in those boxes that frankly probably shouldn't be there anymore. They're not as highly desirable. So I'm going to go through that and sort of freshen it up, take some stuff out, add some stuff to it. So if you're going to the Syracuse Fairground show in 
uh, on April 19th. Uh, you might see, uh, you, I definitely got some new table runners that I had already uh, received before uh, I did the Springfield show. So they were in action there. But, uh, you know, I only had one table at the Springfield show. So had to sort of condense. So when you see me, if you're familiar with my, my setup, when you see me in uh, April 19th, uh, it will look different. I'll have some new cases. Uh, you know, I'll have some new shelving that will be actually off the table and behind the table uh, with wax that uh, I have rather than have it on the table. And so I'll be doing some things differently. I'll have a different look. And you, you take inspiration sometimes uh, from others. So that's probably, as far as the show was on Saturday, I think that was the most... You know, I, the, I, the, the thing I got from it the most is, is change it up a little bit. Do uh, do something a little bit different and refresh your boxes. Do the shelving behind the table, new cases and that sort of thing. So looking forward to my home show, right, and sort of having my clientele that kind of knows me and, and looks for me. That's always a nice a nice perk to have, right? Kind of your, your home field advantage. So that'll be April 19th. And, uh, uh, you know, I get, now I got to try to get everything done, uh, before then, but, uh, somehow we'll, we'll get it done. It might be a couple late nights in there, but, uh, we'll, we'll make it happen. So, uh, with that being said, I want to again, uh, thank everyone that, uh, made the trip fun, made it possible, uh, I don't always, you know, get on the road that often. You know, obviously the national every year. Uh, sometimes Dallas. Uh, I like to go to Dallas every year, but it uh, hasn't worked out exactly like that. And so when an opportunity arises to where you can do that, it's always fun, right? You don't know how many times that opportunity will present itself or if it will again. So when it does, you, it's always nice to take advantage. So uh, thanks to everyone that uh, I met. Uh, or met for the first time and and, and offered hospitality uh, as well. So we're going to call that uh, this week's episode of Hobby Quick Hits. Thank you out there for listening. If you enjoy the show, uh, we appreciate great reviews. Uh, we appreciate your time. You could be listening to something else or doing something else, and you're here listening uh, to me, and I appreciate that, and I, uh, I thank you for it. We'll see you next time.